Who is this figure sneaking into the palace of the gods on Mount Olympus? An intruder? Here? Impossible. How dare he enter? Why has this mysterious figure stolen fire from the gods? Does he not realize that a terrible punishment awaits him? It all began a long, long time ago. Remember? At the dawn of time there was chaos. Then came Gaia, the Earth Mother. Gaia brought forth Uranus, the sky. And from their union were born the Titans, the Cyclopses and the Hecatonchires. Among the Titans was Iapetus. Iapetus chose a wife named Clymene. Together they had four children. Atlas, Menoetius, Epimetheus, and the key figure in this story, Prometheus. Unlike his brother Epimetheus, whose name means hindsight or he who thinks last, the name Prometheus means forethought or he who thinks first. This rare quality proved to be of great value to him. When Zeus waged war against his father Cronus in the battle for supreme power, the Titans formed an alliance against him. All of them? All except one, Prometheus. The one whose name is synonymous with forethought. Prometheus predicted that Zeus would emerge victorious from this conflict. So naturally, he offered his services to the future king of Olympus and he persuaded his brother Epimetheus to do likewise. In the ensuing blaze, Prometheus supplied the young Zeus with what he lacked. The strength, the wiles, and the cunning that the generation of Titans had in abundance. Thus began the terrible war known as the Titanomachy. As predicted by Prometheus, Zeus prevailed. The world then entered a period of relative peace. No more battles, shows of prowess and remarkable feats. Henceforth the days succeeded one another in much the same way. And in this too perfect peace the gods became bored. No more war. Nobody to make happy nor to make suffer. Nothing. So, bored, Zeus turned to his son, Hephaestus, the god of blacksmiths, the one who forged weapons and assigned them to the deities of Olympus. Zeus asked him to make something different, something other than all these pointless objects, something special, something unique, something that could distract the gods. Hephaestus pondered, special, unique, easy enough to say, but what? Hephaestus thought long and hard and came up with an idea. He summoned to his workshop the dozen main gods who lived on Olympus and explained to them what he wanted from them. He wanted them to merge earth and fire and any other substances that could be combined. With these primordial elements they would fashion living beings. Some would have fins lakes and shells. These would be called animals. Others would be just like the gods. These would be called men. And there would only be males. This would now prevent the gods from becoming bored. Everything was ready. It remained only to decide which qualities would be attributed to animals and to men.
Zeus assigned the task to the Titans Prometheus and Epimetheus. Epimetheus was full of enthusiasm. He pleaded with his brother to allow him to take care of distribution. And Prometheus, although known for his foresight, was foolish enough to accept. Epimetheus got to work. He endowed some with strength, others with speed. He gave some a coat of hair to protect them from bad weather, while giving others hooves or even a heavy hide. Once his work was done, he stood up and rubbed his hands together. But what about the men? In his eagerness, Epimetheus had completely forgotten about men. Look, here they are in front of him, naked, destitute, vulnerable. Worse still, having squandered all the resources granted to him by Zeus, Epimetheus had no way of making amends for his oversight. Prometheus decided to go in search of Zeus to beg a favor of him. He wanted men to have the means to protect themselves from ferocious animals and perhaps even a way to cook their food. They should be given fire. Zeus agreed. He struck the ground with a lightning bolt and fire swept through the treetops. Men would only have to climb them to collect it. This was the Golden Age. Men led peaceful lives. And it was a rather happy existence as there was no such thing as work or, for that matter, seasons or diseases. Wheat grew naturally with no need for sowing or cultivation. Men and gods would meet up for sumptuous banquets. Life went by in a trouble-free existence. It could have been paradise. Just one thing separated humans from gods, and that was immortality. But during this period, men did not really die. When their time came, without any tiredness or suffering, they would quietly fall asleep. Hypnos, the god of sleep, then took them into the green valleys of the underground world, to a place known as the Elysian Fields. But then, one day, Zeus tired of sharing his life with humans on an equal footing, of sharing the same table with them, of watching them join in the same assemblies. He decided it was time that men were put in their place. It was time to bring a little order to the world. Zeus at the summit, the gods a notch below, with men further down at the bottom. So Zeus organized a big festival in the vast plains of Mekon, where he brought men and gods together. He ordered a large ox to be slain and divided into two parts. The best part, of course, would go to the gods, while the rest was for men. And it is on these words, the best part, that the fate of humanity would be played out.
All the gods approved of Zeus's decision, except Prometheus. Prometheus did not like these new rules. He especially feared that the benefits he had accorded men would be taken away from them. Zeus charged him with making the sacrifice and dividing up the ox. Prometheus was eager to accept, for he had resolved to deceive Zeus. Prometheus sacrificed the animal. He began by stripping it entirely of its flesh. Then he gathered together all the bones, only the bones, and covered them with an appetizing coat of fat. Taken as a whole then, the pile had a very tempting appearance. Here was the first part. It was inedible, but appeared to be the best. Then Prometheus collected together all the meat, everything that was good and edible, but he hid it beneath a pile of bones and thick skin. This second part looked most unappetizing. Prometheus then showed the two piles to Zeus, whose choice would decide the boundary between men and gods. Zeus, of course, chose the part that to him seemed the most appealing, the one that Prometheus had covered in an appetizing layer of fat. But on discovering that it consisted only of bare, inedible bones, he went into a fit of rage. Thus, men, the protégés of the deceitful Prometheus, would be made to pay. Zeus first decided to hide from them the wheat which thus far had grown freely, needing to be neither sown nor cultivated. Humans would henceforth need to work in order to feed themselves and to survive. Then the Lord of Olympus confiscated fire. The punishment was a terrible one. Without fire, it was impossible to cook food to eat. Impossible to have light when the nighttime enveloped the earth. Impossible to produce warmth during the cold winter days. And impossible too to fight off ferocious animals. Prometheus hurried to Athena. Athena was the great Olympian goddess. She was also the daughter of Zeus. She was fond of Prometheus. To her, he pleaded the case of men, punished for a wrong that was not their doing. The goddess was obviously moved by Prometheus's words, so much so that when he pleaded with her to be allowed to slip unnoticed into Olympus, she acquiesced. It was Prometheus then, whom we saw stealing as inconspicuously as possible into the land of the gods. And it was he who took one of the embers from the sacred fire of Olympus and hid it in a hollow fennel stalk. And he, Prometheus, who then gave fire to man. This new challenge to the king of Olympus could not go unpunished. Zeus vowed to make Prometheus pay. Once again, he summoned his son Hephaestus. Hephaestus and the gods had created only males. Zeus ordered him to forge a woman. A woman made from the earth, a woman in the image of the goddesses. Not only should she be fabulous and boast breathtaking beauty, she had also to be endowed with qualities of every type. Aphrodite conferred upon her grace. Athena dressed her in the most beautiful clothes. The Horai garlanded her with flowers. The Charites adorned her with necklaces. And then Hermes, on orders from Zeus, 
gave her a shameful mind, a deceitful nature, an insatiable appetite for sex, and most importantly, curiosity. She was given the name Pandora. Pandora, meaning all gifted. The wondrous femme fatale was now ready. Zeus breathed life into her. Pandora then was the first woman, the forebear of all women. But most of all, Pandora was the fire that Zeus would introduce into men without his needing to light the flame. A thievish fire, reflecting the fire stolen by Prometheus. Now she just had to be slipped into the bed of a man. But not just any man. One who thinks after the event. It would have to be Epimetheus. He who realized when it was too late. He who was most like us. He who kept on making plans even though the course of events was contrary to his predictions. And if there's one thing that makes the gods laugh, it's the schemes of man. Hermes then went to Epimetheus. He presented him with the sublime creature. Epimetheus hesitated. His brother, Prometheus, had implored him to refuse any gifts from Zeus. Because unlike his brother, Prometheus foresaw. He had the ability to envisage and predict. But, dazzled by Pandora's beauty, poor Epimetheus welcomed her with open arms. But there was another important thing. Before sending Pandora to Earth, Zeus gave her a box. A magnificent box embellished with stunning adornments. Into this box, every god had slipped something harmful and destructive. The box then contained all the woes of the world. Hunger, thirst, disease, death. Zeus, of course, had cautioned Pandora to never open the box under any circumstances which was all he needed to say to arouse her curiosity. On her wedding night after her marriage to Epimetheus, no longer able to resist the compelling temptation of discovering what was in the box, Pandora slipped out of bed and she lifted the lid. Out flew all the misfortunes and miseries of the world. All the awful things that would afflict the lives of human beings till the end of time. Zeus had made these woes invisible and silent so that they could strike men at any moment, leaving them no time to fend them off. To make matters worse, this malevolence mingled with the kindness that the gods had poured on men previously, making it impossible for it to be recognized or identified. Aghast, Pandora immediately slammed shut the lid of the box, but it was too late. Prometheus had deceived Zeus by making something seem other than what it was, the bare bones covered in fat, the stolen fire hidden in a fennel stem. And now Pandora was the king of the gods' retort to this reversal. Beneath the captivating charms of Pandora, he had hidden the direst of scourges. From now on, forever separated from the gods, man would have to plant a seed in the belly of a woman if he wished to reproduce, just as he would have to plant a seed in the earth if he wanted to eat. Good and evil forever combined. But all was not lost. 
for something remained locked away at the bottom of Pandora's box. Something that did not have time to escape before Pandora slammed shut the lid. It had been slipped in surreptitiously by Hermes without the knowledge of Zeus, and he had called it Elpis, meaning hope. Thus, in the worst tragedies, humanity could continue to believe and to hope. Zeus had punished the mortals. Now he had to punish their benefactor. And he would do so in the cruelest of ways. Zeus wanted to make an example of him. He put Prometheus in chains on a rock, somewhere on the summit of the Caucasus, between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. He then ordered an eagle to devour his liver. The liver symbolized the prime cut that Prometheus had wanted to keep for men. Every day, the eagle devoured the liver of Prometheus. And to make the suffering even more terrible, every night while Prometheus was agonizing, the liver would regenerate. In this way, his suffering would last for eternity. Prometheus accepted the sentence of Zeus. Instead of moaning, instead of complaining, he continued to defy his torturer. Because in truth, Prometheus had secret knowledge. Knowledge that would one day lead to Zeus's downfall. Zeus knew this. It was also why he did not order the eagle to kill Prometheus. He hoped that one day Prometheus would acquiesce and reveal to him this secret. But Prometheus, in chains, remained silent. If Zeus wanted to know, he would first have to set him free. Thousands of years went by. On Earth, gods, demigods, and even mere mortals performed great feats. And in every case, Zeus managed to save his throne whenever threatened. But he simply had to find out what the secret about him was that Prometheus refused to reveal. Eventually, the master of Olympus yielded. He sent the most powerful of his mortal sons to set Prometheus free. Heracles killed the eagle with an arrow straight through the heart and broke Prometheus's chains. The Titan, thus liberated, honored his promise and revealed his secret to Zeus. His secret was that if Zeus were to wed Thetis, the sea nymph with whom he was so besotted, then he would bring into the world a son more powerful than his father, who would dethrone him. Zeus immediately ended his courting of Thetis and married her off to a mortal. Prometheus, though, was the god who protected men. He was also a figure of rebellion and revolt. Someone who tells us that to challenge power is honorable and on occasion even necessary. But he also tells us that determining order itself is a mistake. 
Despite his great foresight, it is a notion that had escaped Prometheus.